Stay away from me, she exclaimed. But Martin kept coming at her with a sneer on his lips. But the look, there was something in his eyes that made Ellen realize he was going to kill her. Usually children remember their early childhood in bits and pieces, some particularly vivid moments. But Ellen didn't have a childhood. Or rather, it was of course, but it ended somehow early, very early. Her grandmother told her mother had been very beautiful when she was young, but Ellen didn't remember her mother as beautiful. She remembered only an unkempt woman with a puffy face who always smelled of alcohol. Ellen didn't remember her father very well. She remembered her father putting her on his shoulders and rolling her around. He was big and strong. He died when Ellen was six years old. The parents married for a lot of love. They had known each other since high school. Since about eighth grade, a tender, half-childlike feeling suddenly arose. They were at the same desk, and he walked her home from school every day, carrying her briefcase. The little boys teased her. She would blush, he would periodically reward the boys with flicks. But really, in their hearts, they both liked it. When they were in high school, their feelings flared up with such intensity that it became clear. It was impossible for them to be without each other. Mom saw her father off in the army, waited for him for two years, and madly missed him. They wrote each other touching letters. Needless to say, as soon as he returned from the army, they got married. And a year later, Ellen was born. Her grandmother told me that she herself did not know who came up with the idea to call her by such an unusual name. When mom and dad announced what they had named their daughter, everyone was surprised, but they liked the name. Grandma was daddy's mom. Mom's mom died when mom was still in high school. Her stepfather raised her, treated her evenly, without much warmth. When mom got married, the stepfather exchanged the three-room apartment for two quite decent one-room apartments, and Mon and Dad got their own place at once. The stepfather settled his personal life, too, and they were no longer in touch. This was largely thanks to my stepfather's new wife, who decided to start life with a clean slate. It would seem live happily ever after, but life decided otherwise. One day, my father didn't come home from work. Mom got a call from the hospital, it turned out that my father had been run over by a car on his way home from work. The injuries were very serious, there was little hope. Two days later, my father died in intensive care, without regaining consciousness. My mother was simply black with grief. My grandmother supported her as best she could, even though she herself had lost her only son. She came, helped with household chores, and took care of Ellen but my mother could not cope with the grief that had fallen on her. At first she withdrew into herself, losing her taste for life, and then she began to drink more and more often. And Ellen's childhood was gone. Hey, Ellen, get in the kitchen, shouted her mother in a drunken voice, and take your artwork and paint there, and go to sleep there. You see, I have guests. Go away, don't disturb the adults. Ellen shrinking into a ball, trying to be as inconspicuous as possible, went into the kitchen. She was used to spending her evenings there. Her mother had guests there often, almost every weekend. When Ellen asked her mother to go to the circus or to the movies as parents of other girls did, the only thing she heard in response was, Leave me alone. I have no time for nonsense. I am tired at work for a week. Now I want to rest and then the guests would come again. Ellen drew in the kitchen, occasionally shuddering from the drunken shouts and drunken laughter coming from the room. She was nine years old now, going to school. She studied easily and with pleasure, she liked going to school. She also liked to draw. It was something she could do for hours. Her mother periodically threw her drawings in the trash, but Ellen persistently drew a family, where there was a strong father, a beautiful mother, and a happy girl. Here they were taking the girl to school, here they were walking in the park, here they were going to the circus, and she really liked to draw animals, and not only cats and dogs, but also all kinds of strange animals from children's stories. She liked to read fairy tales very much. 
Her grandmother bought her a lot of books, and Ellen read them with gusto. Until a scathing shout from her mother was heard. Ellen, you're reading nonsense again, you lazy girl. Clean up the apartment, quick. Dust everywhere, and she's reading. And peel the potatoes, or people will come, and there's nothing to eat. Ellen hid the book and went to clean up and peel potatoes. In the evening, her mother's guests would come, and they would drink again, eating fried potatoes and pickles. Only when Ellen was at her grandmother's house did she manage to eat something tasty. Grandmother would make pancakes or pancakes when her granddaughter came home, feed her a tasty lunch in the afternoon, and give her a baked pie to take home with her. But grandmother lived far away, and her mother rarely allowed her to go to her, and she did not allow grandmother to come to their house. If you keep running to grandma, you know it. I will throw you out, put you in an orphanage, since your mother is no authority on you. I don't want your grandmother to turn you against your mother. Ellen was very afraid that her mother would carry out her threat, and she did not tell her grandmother anything. She always said that they lived very well, that mother had not drunk for a long time, that they went for walks and to the movies together, and mama loves her very much. She wanted it to be like that. She dreamed that someday it would be like that. Eh, hey, I wish I could go to grandma's now, Ellen thought sadly. She would have fed her something delicious, and it would be nice to stay at her place just once and sleep outside the kitchen. But Ellen had no money for fare, and her mother wouldn't give her any. The sound of a door opening brought her out of her thoughts. One of her mother's guests, a rather tipsy man, entered the kitchen. He looked at Ellen in surprise with drunken eyes and shouted, Hey, Amy, or whatever your name is, Who's that? Is that your little one? Her mother came staggering out of the room. What are you shouting about? Yes, my daughter, what do you want? She's sitting there, painting, not touching anybody, so let her sit there. The man looked again at Ellen. Hey, kid, come on, go get some cigarettes at the stall, we're all out. And be quick about it. Are you out of your mind? Mother was surprised. She won't get any. What do you mean they won't let her? Let her cry that daddy's sick, can't go out, and wants to smoke. They'll believe the little one. If she doesn't, I'll tear her ears off. Her mother handed Ellen the money and said, That's right. Now, get over to the store, quick. Ellen silently took the money, put on her jacket and boots, went outside, walked to the bus stop, got on the bus, and went to her grandmother's house. She never went back to her mother's place. She stayed with her grandmother. Her mother came at first with the intention of making a scandal and taking Ellen away, but her grandmother quickly put her down. So here's the deal. My granddaughter lives with me. That's it. She's been through enough with you. I won't let you ruin her life. If you get smart, you're welcome. If not, go away and don't come back. And God forbid you try to do something bad to your granddaughter. Remember, I am her guardian angel now. For Ellen, everything changed. Grandma had truly become her guardian angel. She loved her granddaughter unconditionally, surrounded her with care and attention. Now Ellen's childhood began. Grandma was always vivacious, beautiful, trim. No one would have guessed that this woman could have a granddaughter of 10 years. They thought Ellen was her daughter. Her mother tried to catch Ellen near school a couple of times, but she quickly ran away, seeing that her mother was still in the same state. So the attempts stopped. The mother simply forgot about her daughter. Ellen was already 19 years old when she was told that her mother had died after being poisoned by surrogate alcohol during another guest party. At the same time, it turned out that her mother had managed to get into so much debt that the inheritance of her small apartment had to be abandoned. Ellen graduated from high school with flying colors. She was an excellent drawer, had a natural sense of style, loved to transform her friends, making them makeup and hairstyles, so she decided to tie her life to the beauty industry. She grew up to be a beautiful, very kind girl. Her grandmother said she looked a lot like her mother, 
who was also a beauty. Ellen remembered her mother wistfully from time to time, and could not rejoice that she had been so lucky in life to have such a grandmother. Her guardian angel. Ellen worked as a makeup stylist for a fashion magazine, but she also had her own clientele. Clients passed her on to each other by word of mouth, saying that Ellen worked wonders. Grandma was very proud of her, but she also wanted her granddaughter to get on with her life, and Ellen was in no hurry. Grandma, you're the one who keeps saying that you shouldn't get involved with anyone just to get married. I live by that principle, Ellen laughed. Of course the girl, of course, the grandmother agreed, but she still wanted so much to see a decent man by her granddaughter's side, liked each other. And then one day, a new photographer showed up at the shoot for the next issue of the magazine. A handsome guy, tall and strong. It was not an easy shoot. But with Martin, that was the guy's name, everything was fun. He joked and giggled and exuded charm. By the end of the shoot, Ellen felt she was dead tired. She was walking slowly down the street, deciding to take a little walk in the air when she heard behind her. Girl, girl, may I join you in your solitude? She looked back. Martin was running toward her. Your name is Ellen, isn't it? Such an unusual name, beautiful. I am Martin. I remember. Ellen laughed. Do you live near here, walking? No, I just thought I'd walk. You don't mind my company, do you? And can we start talking on a first-name basis? I don't mind. Ellen laughed again, answering both questions at once. Martin turned out to be an interesting person to talk to. They walked for a long time, then they had coffee at a small coffee house and Martin accompanied Ellen home. Do you live here? Do you rent an apartment? Martin asked. No, I don't. I live with my grandmother. That's cool. But I'm from here, so I have to rent a place. Martin answered. All right, see you tomorrow. Don't be late. Tomorrow is another tough shoot. Grandmother noted that her granddaughter arrived much later than usual, but did not ask anything. Ellen and Martin started seeing each other regularly. The relationship spun and Ellen was over the moon. She was genuinely in love with Martin. At work, she fluttered like a butterfly. The girls invite her, how she stole such a handsome man from everybody. Even her friend Agnes, with whom she went to school together and now worked in the same magazine, once said, You're lucky, Ellen, you've got such a guy. Ellen smiled and didn't notice the envy in her friend's words. Grandma, I want you to meet someone tonight, Ellen said timidly. At last, Granny laughed. I've been waiting for you to introduce me to your boyfriend. I thought I couldn't wait. Come over, I'll make you a nice meal. In the evening, sitting at the table, Martin shone with his wit, complimenting Ellen and Grandma. Grandma was very friendly and attentive. Ellen was happy. The two people she loved most liked each other so much. When Martin left, she asked, Grandma, isn't he wonderful? Grandma was quiet for a minute, smiling. Then she said, Ellen, he's a very sensible and charming fellow. Tell me, do you know much about him? Who is he? Where is he from? Who are his parents? Grandma, what does it matter? He loves me, I love him. He's very serious about me. Today he hinted that we're getting married. You didn't answer, Grandma said seriously. Do you know much about him? I've been trying to ask him all night. He always dodged the question. I've noticed that he knows everything about you. How much do you know about him? You don't say anything. Not much. And you want to spend your life with him. Listen to me, Ellen. Please take your time. Get to know him and get to know him. Ellen nodded in agreement, but she felt a little bit sick at heart. Apparently, Martin just didn't like her grandmother. That was why she was trying to plant the seed of doubt in her soul. She continued to see Martin. After a while, he asked her to move in with him. Even though I rented a house, but let's start living at my place. After all, 
it would be uncomfortable for us to live in an apartment with your grandmother. We will disturb her. She is an elderly person, with her own habits, with her own way of life. Why would we make her uncomfortable? Martin, Ellen exclaimed. You are so good, so considerate. I agree. Let's give it a try. When Ellen announced her decision to her grandmother, she disapproved. Ellen, you're an adult, you can make your own decisions. I'm your guardian angel, remember. I just want to caution you again. Take your time, find out more about him. He seemed a little, how shall I put it, slippery to me. Grandmother, Ellen answered firmly. There was metal in her voice. You're right. I'm an adult, and it's up to me. Tomorrow, I'm moving in with Martin. Grandmother sighed and said nothing more to her granddaughter. Ellen moved in with Martin. They began their life together. Ellen couldn't be happy with her lover. They went to and from work together. They shared household chores equally. Martin was always affectionate, responsive, attentive. A dream, not a man. The grandmother, of course, was too suspicious. The first warning bell rang about a couple of weeks later, when a new employee came to work for them. Ellen ran into him outside the coffee machine. They got to know each other, exchanged a few words, laughed, took their coffee, and went their separate ways. What was Ellen's surprise when, after a day of work, she found that Martin had already gone home. Alone. Without her. When she arrived home, Martin did not come out to greet her but sat in the kitchen grimmer than a cl Did you show up? You don't know where you are, and there's no supper. I don't understand. What do you mean, you don't know where? I was at work, and why did you leave without me? Why should I wait for you? You've got better things to do, at least more interesting than making dinner for the man you love. Martin, what's your complaint? You came before me, so why didn't you cook dinner yourself? I thought we agreed on that. So what changed? Yeah, I'm going to cook dinner, and you're going to wander around with who knows where and who knows who. Martin exclaimed with unconcealed anger. Martin, what's going on? Ellen was trying to hold back as best she could. Who am I fooling around with? Oh, come on. Agnes told me how you were cooing and laughing with our new employee. What, did you find a replacement for me? You're probably throwing yourself at everyone new, aren't you? Ellen turned around, walked silently out the door. She was on her way to the bus stop when Martin ran up behind her. He stopped her, put his arm around her. Ellen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, fool. I am a fool, a complete idiot. Forgive me. I do not know what came over me. I was just so scared you'd leave me. Martin, you really are an idiot. I love you. I don't need anyone but you. They stood hugging for a few minutes. Then Martin said, Ellen, let's get married. Huh. I don't want to live with you as roommates. I've always wanted a family. Ellen laughed happily and nodded. When she informed her grandmother that she and Martin were getting married, she sighed. You're in a hurry, after all. But since you love him so much, well, advice and love and may all be well with you. Be happy, my girl. Ellen hugged her grandmother, but there was an unpleasant worm stirring in her soul. Grandmother didn't believe Martin after all. They didn't have a wedding. They just signed their names and celebrated modestly at home. Grandma cooked a delicious dinner. Ellen invited two of her friends, Agnes and another one, Sandra, who lived down the hall. No one else was there, Strangely, there were no friends or relatives on Martin's side. Grandma asked, Martin, wouldn't any of your relatives or friends be there? Oh, no. I don't have any relatives, and I haven't made any friends in this town yet. Grandmother was silent. She did not like the answer. She caught a glimpse of her granddaughter, but Ellen was absorbed in Martin. Ellen and Martin continued to live at his rented apartment. Everything was fine. Until a month later, thunder struck. Grandma passed away. Ellen couldn't get over her grief. Martin supported and comforted her as best he could. 
but Ellen knew that her guardian angel had left her. Part 2 Ellen and Martin continued to live in his rented apartment. Everything was fine. Until a month later, my grandmother passed away. Ellen couldn't get over her grief. Martin supported and comforted her as best he could. But Ellen understood. Her guardian angel had left her. A month later, Martin offered to move into her grandmother's apartment. Ellen, let's move there. And for you, everything there is your own, native. You'll feel at one with your grandmother. And we won't have to pay rent. We'll save. At some point, we'll decide to have kids, too. It made sense, and Ellen agreed. She went to the apartment by herself first and cleaned it up. And as she was leaving the doorway with a bag of garbage, a cat ran up to her. An ordinary trickler, it came up to Ellen, started rubbing her feet and looking into her eyes in a way that made her feel uncomfortable. It was as if the cat's gaze was staring right into her soul. Where did you come from? Ellen asked Ellen affectionately and stroked the cat. The cat purred softly in response. You were such a singer too. Ellen laughed. Shall we go to my place? Murr. Murr. The cat replied in agreement. Ellen and Martin moved into her grandmother's apartment. The cat was named Roxy. They lived on the fifth floor. Roxy turned out to be a remarkably intelligent cat. Sometimes, she would go for walks outside and easily return to the fifth floor. Sometimes one of the neighbors would even give her a ride in the elevator. She would follow Ellen around, but she wouldn't go near Martin at all, as if she didn't like him. Sometimes, curled up in an armchair, Roxy watched Martin's every move carefully, as if she were waiting for something. He and Martin made a good repair. Roxy, of course, helped them. And then a strange thing happened. Ellen was on her way back from work. The mood was great. Friday, spring, warm weather, the weekend ahead, and she managed to leave work on time. She decided to arrange a romantic evening for her beloved husband, cook something delicious, light candles. Ellen was walking from the store. As she was crossing the street near her house, her cell phone rang. Ellen was on her way to the sidewalk, pulled out her phone, and suddenly something came crashing down on her shoulders from somewhere above. Ellen couldn't stay on her feet and fell forward onto the sidewalk. At the same second, a car rushed past her at a monstrous speed. If she hadn't fallen onto the sidewalk, Ellen stood up. The street was quiet, there were no people around. Where did that car come from? And what was it that fell on her shoulders, practically pushing her onto the sidewalk? Ellen looked around. Sitting next to her was Roxy. Her Roxy. She was the one who had jumped onto Ellen and saved her from under the wheels. Roxy, Ellen exhaled. Where did you come from? Moor, Moor, the cat answered. Strange, she had never gone far before, walking only in the yard, chasing pigeons. Ellen picked up the shopping bag, took Moor in her other hand. Roxy is mine. You just saved me. You're my guardian angel now, aren't you? Moor, Moor, the cat answered again, looking Ellen intently in the eyes. At home, after cooking dinner, Ellen told Martin what had happened. He was really worried. Did you see the car? Did you get the license plate number? Do you remember anything at all? No, Martin, I fell forward on the sidewalk. I didn't see anything. Probably some drunken daredevil. If it hadn't been for Roxy, see, Grandma's gone, but she sent me a new guardian angel. Ellen smiled, stroking Roxy. Martin's reaction surprised her. His face suddenly contorted with anger, and he practically hissed back. What kind of nonsense are you babbling about? Your grandmother was always saying that she was your guardian angel, and now you are too. You're a grown woman now. That's ridiculous. You found a guardian angel. And your grandmother is also a guardian. You think I didn't realize she had a grudge against me. I saw the way she was watching me, like she was looking for something. And she's been spewing all kinds of nonsense about me on your head. 
and you repeat the ramblings of a senile old woman. And you bring your stupid cat into the mix too. Ellen was taken aback. Roxy arched her back and glared at Martin, hissing as if she understood. How dare you talk about my grandmother like that? She was the closest person to me. She's the reason I'm alive in the first place. Oh, I heard the sob story of your childhood. You're a grown woman. It's time to forget, and you're still whining. Ellen was silent for a moment, and then she looked up at Martin and spoke softly. And my grandmother was right about something. I don't know you at all. Now it's as if I see another man in front of me, not the man I married. And what do you see? Martin asked mockingly. I see a monster, Ellen answered quietly. Do you really? Really? What are you going to do now? Martin laughed avily. I'll just leave you, she said tiredly. And who would let you do that? Brave, isn't she? She will break up with me. I don't think so. Your grandmother is no more, no more. No one to stand up for you. You'll live with me, and that's it. Ellen couldn't believe her ears. Was this coming from her loving husband? This could not be. She looked at Martin and was frightened. There was a kind of morbid gleam in his eyes. She had never seen him like that. You cannot make me, she answered. Go away at once. Martin stood up and smacked her across the face. Ellen flew into a corner and fell down next to the couch. Her head was spinning. She saw Martin coming toward her. Stay away from me, she exclaimed. But Martin kept coming at her with a sneer on his lips. But the look, there was something in his eyes that made Ellen realize he was going to kill her. And then the unbelievable happened. Roxy, hissing and bellowing angrily, jumped on Martin and clawed at his shoulder with her teeth and claws. Martin screamed in pain, blood gushing from his wounds. He pulled the cat off him with great difficulty and flung it violently into the corner. Roxy fell and stood motionless. Ellen grabbed the bottle of wine she had bought for the romantic evening from the table and kicked Martin in the head as hard as she could. The blow wasn't hard, but it was painful. Martin screamed and ran out into the hallway. Fool, both you and your stupid cat, you'll be sorry. Ellen rushed into the hallway and bolted the door. Roxy lay motionless in the corner. Ellen bent down, picked up her breathless body, and burst into tears. Sandra's phone rang. Sandra, he killed Roxy and wanted to kill me. Ellen sobbed into the phone. Wait, stay where you are. I'll be right there, shouted Sandra and rushed to the door. She ran to the next door, went up to Ellen and banged on the door. Who? Ellen's sobbing voice came through the door. Ellen, open up immediately. It's me, Sandra. Sandra rushed into the apartment and was taken aback. Ellen had a fresh bruise on her face. Is it Martin? Sandra exhaled. Ellen nodded and briefly told Sandra what had happened. Oh my goodness, the neighbor exclaimed. I didn't expect it from him. He was such a caring and loving husband. I'm terribly frightened, sobbed Ellen. I've never seen him like that. He really seemed like he was going to kill me, if it hadn't been for Roxy. She saved my life twice today, and he killed her. Whoa, Sandra didn't understand. And who is that sitting there in the chair? Ellen looked around and almost screamed in amazement. In the chair sat Roxy, alive and well and unharmed. How could it be? Ellen was confused. Roxy is mine. I saw that she wasn't even breathing. More, said Roxy, jumping down from her chair and coming over to rub herself against her. Ellen picked up the cat in her arms, hugged it, stroked it, and cried with happiness. Yes, my friend, Sandra stretched out. I guess cats do have nine lives. Ellen laughed happily. I don't know about nine lives, but she's definitely my guardian angel. Ellen laughed happily. I don't know about nine lives, but she's definitely my guardian angel. A little later, when Sandra had put Ellen to bed and given her a facial, 
she asked. However, what to do about your hubby? I don't know, Sandra. Get a divorce, that's for sure. But now I'm just afraid of him. So then, my friend, the neighbor said firmly. One, change the lock on the door. Second, file for divorce. And three, there is also a third, Ellen asked. I think that's all you need to say. No, honey, that's not it. We have to deal with your Martin. I know in my heart that he won't give up so easily. His anger flared up all of a sudden today, like he was annoyed you weren't hit. Don't you think that's strange? Ellen thought about it. Sandra was right. Martin had flipped out when she talked about how she'd been saved by Roxy from a speeding car. Sandra was right. It was strange. Let's put it this way, Sandra continued. You know Max, right? My neighbor? Let's go to him, shall we? Why him? Well, he's a private detective. He has his own agency. So let him investigate. Let's find out who this Martin of yours really is. What's wrong with him? Are his services expensive? Ellen asked, frightened. I don't have much money right now. I just did some repairs. Sandra laughed. We'll see. But somehow I think Max will do everything for you. He's loved you since high school. I'll call him now. Sandra took out her phone. Max listened carefully to Ellen, wrote down all the details of Martin. Ellen, I will find out everything I can. And you really should change the locks. And in general, it is better not to go anywhere alone for now. Can you take a spontaneous vacation from work? I can. Then take it. If you need anything, you better call me or Sandra. Don't go anywhere. And don't open the door for anyone. Especially not Martin. I don't like this situation. Max frowned. The next day, Ellen called a locksmith, and he put in a new lock. Martin did not call or show up. Ellen went to work, asked for a couple of weeks off at her own expense for family reasons. She was granted it with no problem. She picked the middle of the day when Martin was supposed to be taking pictures on set. She was caught by Agnes. Hey, girlfriend, what's up? Why are you wearing glasses? Ellen took off her glasses. Oh my goodness, what kind of trouble are you in? Ellen went to the coffee machine for a cup of coffee and briefly told her friend what had happened. Oh really? Martin, I wouldn't have believed it. What a statement to win. Agnes exclaimed. What a bastard. All right, Agnes, I'll take my leave now. Ellen waved her hand and hurried away. When she reached the house, she saw Sandra. Hi, what are you doing here? I'm waiting for you, she said. What if he showed up? I don't know. Don't you have anything to buy? No, Sandra. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll call you tonight. I'll call you tonight. Sandra called every evening, every morning, and several times in the afternoon, too. Strangely enough, Martin didn't say anything. Four days later, Max called and asked if he could come over. He came along with Sandra. Roxy happily greeted them and immediately climbed into Max's arms. You have a cool cat, he said. It is a three color, which means that it brings happiness. Already did. Twice. Ellen smiled. Okay, Max, don't be impatient. Sandra interrupted their conversation impatiently. You called us here for a reason, didn't you? Spit it out. Not for nothing, he agreed. Your Martin is quite a character, isn't he? He's not an orphan. He's not from out of town. His parents live here, or rather, his mother and stepfather, who raised him. I met them. They don't know anything about him since he left home. He was 18 years old at the time. After he almost killed their youngest son, his mother and stepfather's mutual son. The stepfather came home early from work at the time and found Martin trying to push his brother off the balcony. When he saw his stepfather, Martin pushed his brother into the room and tried to make it look as if he wanted to jump out and Martin stopped him. But that excuse didn't work. In the end, Martin lashed out in a fit of anger and screamed at his parents that he hated his brother because he wanted to remain an only child 
and not share the inheritance with anyone else. There you go. And I think he stuck to you because of the apartment. I tracked down this girl he was in a long-term relationship with. He was even going to get married. But as soon as he found out that the apartment she was living in was in her father's name, he ran right away. But before that, he took his anger out on her. She was in the hospital for a month afterwards. Ellen listened with horror. Was this really all about Martin? About her husband, who had been so gentle and attentive and caring at first. It turned out that Grandma had been right when she had said to take her time. And it was really about the apartment. After all, he had just unobtrusively asked Ellen about who the apartment was registered to. And Grandma had given the apartment to her granddaughter a long time ago. Ellen, you have to file for divorce right away. And be very careful. I don't think the driver of that car was a drunken daredevil. Max and Sandra left, and Ellen was left in a state of shock. The next day, Ellen filed for divorce. Then she and Sandra went shopping, took a walk, chatted. And in the evening, a relieved Ellen came home. She opened the door, put the shopping bag on the floor. Roxy, where are you? Why aren't you there? She shouted. No one came out. Ellen was surprised. Roxy always met her. Ellen went into the room, even forgetting to lock the door. In the room, she received a blow to the head and passed out. When she woke up, she felt she couldn't move. Her hands were tied behind her back with duct tape, and her feet were tied too. Her mouth was taped shut. Above her, Martin stood smirking. Roxy was waiting. Huh? You can't wait. Your Roxy flew off the balcony. Ellen cried. Fifth floor. Yes, and you're going to follow her soon, continued Martin angrily. Damn, why? Why did that lousy cat get in the way then? Wouldn't have to mess with you now. You'd have been hit by a car, and that would have been it. Ellen fidgeted and tried to scream. What are you fidgeting for? Don't you fidget. You won't make it, and no one will hear you. You filed for divorce, you bitch, and now you're going to die, and I'm still your husband, and I'll inherit your apartment. My folks screwed me out of my place. Martin smirked. You think you changed the locks? You thought it would help? I didn't think so. Your friend Agnes made me a mold of the keys. She's been crazy about me for a long time. She's stupid. She believed you were crazy after the accident. You're all idiots. There was a rustling sound behind Martin's back. Ellen opened her eyes wide in amazement. Roxy. Where on earth did you come from, my good man? Martin looked back. Roxy arched her back and hissed. It's that damn cat again. Wait till you've flown for me. Martin shouted, heading toward the cat. Don't even think about it, came Max's voice. And with a short precise blow, he put Martin on the floor. After the police left, when the interview was over and Martin was taken to the police station, Max sat next to Ellen and gave her a cup of tea. Roxy nestled in her mistress' lap. Max, I don't understand how you knew I was in trouble. Roxy told me. Max smiled. She brought me here. Wait. How did she get here in the first place? Ellen was surprised. Martin said he threw her off the balcony. I don't understand it myself, Max admitted. I was sitting there when I heard a knock on the balcony door. I look out. There's Roxy on the balcony. There is a tall tree next to the house. Maybe she jumped from the branch to the balcony. But how did she know where I live? I was just stunned. I let her in, and she like a madwoman, runs to the front door, looking back at me and meows, as if calling me to him. So I went. She led me to your front door. That's when I knew something was wrong. Good thing you didn't lock the front door. Ellen looked at Roxy, who looked at her mistress again, as if she were looking right into her soul. Roxy is mine, so is it true that cats have nine lives? More? Mur, Roxy replied. You really are my guardian angle, Ellen whispered, hugging the cat. Murr, Murr, answered Roxy again. Maybe my grandmother sent you. 
and maybe this is your grandmother? Max asked with a smile. Roxy turned around and looked at him carefully. Murr. Murr, she answered. <laughs>